Hmm. I usually uh, pray when I, before I preach, but Steve really said it all in his prayer, so we'll, uh, we'll leave that part and go on to the next part. And I just want to say thank you very, very much for, uh, to Pastor Jason and to the elders uh, for inviting me to come and speak to you again. Uh, I'd almost forgotten about that second time when I was recorded, and if anybody can remember, it was in a house that was under construction. This is the only guy I could find to record me, and I was balancing on the steps inside the house. <laughs> so I'm glad it's a lot easier. Uh, the conditions are, are better here. Um, <clears throat> It just is a delight to be with you again. Uh, I think I probably use the same jokes over and over, and you get to an age where you can't remember what, what you said where, but um, I think I probably said last time that it's such um, a, a relief or a joy because um, when you have a 10 o'clock service, I, I have to get up at the crack of dawn, and I know you farmers will laugh at that, but uh, we leave really early to get to Bristol Memorial for 9 o'clock. And um, then we have a big lot of time after the service, and then we go to Fort Collunge. So when you don't have to be in Shawville till 10, I mean, it's just, <laughs> you can sleep in a little bit. It's, it's a real luxury. Well, I'm going to do something a little different today, and that is um, speak on something I don't think is very often talked about. I don't think I ever heard a sermon on this subject, and I would be very surprised if you ever have. But you can tell me afterwards that, oh yes, you've heard a lot about it. And I didn't know what to call it. Um, fortunately, I don't have to have a title, because there's no bulletin, or it's not going to be in the newspaper, or it's not going to be in the equity or anything. Um, I could have given it a kind of dry title like Problem Verses in the Psalms or a sort of provocative one like Hate Thy Neighbor with two question marks. But what I want to talk to you is about, um, well, first of all, Psalm 139 is going to be my text. And uh, so I'll read that to you. If you've got your Bible, you might want to turn to Psalm 139 which is headed a psalm of David. <clears throat> o Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. O oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? 
I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Most Christians love the Psalms. You know, I've often gone on visits into people's homes And maybe there's a Bible sitting out on the table. Um, Kind of hope that it wasn't just put out there because they knew I was coming. (laughs) But um, maybe some lady will go out into the kitchen to make me a cup of tea and I'll just pick up her Bible and just kind of look at it. And and usually the middle, the the, the New Testament is well thumbed. You know, it really looks worn in the last part of the Bible. And then the other place that's worn is right in the center where the Psalms are. Christians like to read the Psalms. And we probably all have our favorites. Um, For many, it's Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Um, Psalm 46 was a favorite of Martin Luther. Um, And he wrote his hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, based on it. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Or Psalm 103, Uh, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. That's just to name a few. Quite possibly, you like Psalm 139, and maybe you've been moved to awe and to worship by it. It tells of God's, and here come some of these wonderful, big, Latinate words, God's omniscience, that is, he knows everything, God's omnipresence. He is present everywhere. And his omnipotence, he can do all things that are consistent with his nature and his will. And yet you may have been puzzled or even shocked as you read this psalm, beautiful Psalm 139, after all this sublime, wonderful poetry that speaks of the greatness of God, to suddenly, abruptly hit those verses that are very, very different. Where it cries out for God to kill the wicked. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I awake and I am still with you. Wonderful. Then suddenly, O that you would slay the wicked. O God, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord. And verses like that, I think have raised a lot of questions in the minds of thoughtful Christians. There are some churches that have what they call a lectionary, which is a list of readings set for each Sunday, uh, that will put these verses, some of these verses in brackets, as though you can can skip them. Or maybe they leave the whole psalm out and and don't use it at all in their their Sunday readings. There are quite a number of verses in the Psalter that sound vengeful and bloodthirsty. Out of 150 psalms, there are about 30 that um, are like this. I'm sure you've read them. I'm sure you've noticed them and wondered about them. Take a few examples. Psalm 35. David says of his enemies, rescue me from their destruction. Lord, do not be silent. Let them not rejoice over me. Fight against those who fight against me. Let them be put to shame and dishonor. Let destruction come upon them. Or Psalm 69, pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. Or Psalm 109, may the children of the wicked man be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let there be none to extend kindness to him, nor any to pity his fatherless children. And one of the strongest expressions is in Psalm 137. Um, I didn't know whether the children would be here or not. Uh, Even though they've gone to Sunday school, I'm not going to read that uh, verse. But it's directed against the Edomites. Blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. And the last line talks about uh, cruelly killing the babies. What are we to make of this? Is it sub-Christian? 
Or can we reconcile it with the teaching of Jesus and his apostles? And I don't claim to have all the answers to uh, this question, but um, I'm going to try to shed some light on it. And maybe we can begin by ruling out some of the approaches that people have taken that I think are wrong. First, some people reject these imprecatory psalms, that's what they're sometimes called, just means psalms of cursing. Uh, they reject these imprecatory psalms out of hand. To them, they would say, well, David and those other psalmists who said these things, they were really just uttering unworthy, ungodly thoughts. Um, thoughts of spite and revenge against personal uh, enemies. They may have said some really good things, things that were inspired by God, but these things are not really very good. Walter Brueggemann is a, a famous uh, Old Testament scholar, um, and he says Psalm 109 is a free, unrestrained speech of rage seeking vengeance. Arthur Weiser says these psalms are the undisguised gloating and cruel vindictiveness of an intolerant religious fanaticism. Wow. And if you're a fan of C.S. Lewis, and I am, I love his writings, uh, well, even C.S. Lewis in his Reflections on the Psalms dismisses these as poems written by ferocious, self-pitying, barbaric men. But if we take a high view of the Bible as the written word of God, I don't think we can just brush these aside that easily. Um, but it's very common in our time, as I'm sure you know, that there are people, there are pastors who, who don't really believe the Bible, the whole Bible is the word of God, and they, they feel they can sit in judgment on parts of it. Um, I watched the Presbyterian Church's General Assembly online. They had a, a virtual assembly in early June, and they were debating uh, some pretty controversial issues. And I remember hearing one minister say in one of his little speeches, the Bible is the product of imperfect people. So that's the way it's seen as just a human book um, Holy Spirit didn't really have that much to do with it, or maybe only certain parts. But the thing is, the problem that we have as Christians who are Bible-believing Christians is that the Psalms and these Psalms are in the canon of Scripture. It's all part of the Word of God. They are quoted by Jesus and his apostles. Now, Jesus didn't necessarily quote the curses, but he quoted the Psalms that contain them and are the context of those curses. They fit with the overall teaching of the Bible. And then closely related to this is the notion that these are Old Testament, and so they're inconsistent with the milder teaching of the New Testament. It's very, a very similar thought. It used to be quite popular. Um, I'm sure that you um, have heard it. it. You still will hear it sometimes that, well, the Old Testament, that's about an angry God of law. But the New Testament, well, that's the God of love and grace and salvation. Someone at the General Assembly, again, I saw online said, don't follow Moses or Paul, follow only Jesus. But it's, that's simplistic. It's just too simple to pit Moses against Jesus when Jesus endorsed the writings of Moses. Um, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would guide his apostles. Paul was the leading apostle. So you can't really put a, a big divide between uh, Jesus and the other writers of Scripture. There is grace in the Old Testament, and there's wrath in the New Testament. And some of the strongest words about judgment are actually found on the lips of Jesus himself. Think of Galatians 1 and verse 8. This is Paul again. But he says, Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to, what, to that which we preached to you, let him be accursed. So there he is. Paul is invoking a curse. An anathema is the literal word. 
And 1 Corinthians 16, 22, if anyone does not love the Lord, meaning the Lord Jesus, if you don't love the Lord Jesus, then let him be accursed, anathema. When Jesus denounced the scribes and the Pharisees, Matthew 23, uh, he said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And that was pretty strong language. The, the language of woe is very similar to a curse. And what about that instruction where he said, if they don't receive the message, shake off the dust of your feet on their town as you leave and go to the next. That's also kind of a dramatic way of issuing a curse. And somebody has said that no other Psalms are quoted as much in the New Testament as the ones that contain these curses, these imprecations. Psalm 69, and um, I think I read earlier where somebody said that that was rage or whatever. Uh, Psalm 69 is alluded to or quoted some 15 times in the Gospels, the letters, and Revelation. And Psalm 109 is quoted with approval as well. So these cursing psalms are part of the written word of God. The scripture that we believe is inspired, which means it's breathed out by God. It was directed by the Holy Spirit. There were human writers, David and all the others were very human, uh, but they were kept from error. The Holy Spirit supervised the whole process of the writing of Scripture so that, as Jesus said, the Scripture cannot be broken. Again, how do we understand these texts and what do they have to teach us? Well, first, I think it's important to say they are not expressions of personal malice or hatred. Think of David himself. David had a lot of shortcomings. He, had, he committed many terrible sins. But at the same time, David was not a vengeful, unforgiving, mean-spirited person. In fact, quite the opposite. Remember the time he had the, the chance to kill King Saul? Um, he, he was in his hands. He could have killed him. And he goes up and he tears off a little piece of his robe and he holds it up and says... See, Saul, I could have killed you, but I'm not going to. Uh, the same was true of Shimei and Nabal. There were a number of times when David was very loving and forgiving. So it doesn't seem to add up to say that they're just personal malice and animosity. They also speak about David's passion for justice. Those who do evil, who persecute God's people, who respond to love with brutality will have to face God's righteous judgment. If people stubbornly refuse to repent, if they keep on in their wrong ways, then God will overcome them and destroy them. Derek Kidner, a writer on the Psalms, says, we may summarize the substance of these Psalms as the plea that justice be done and that the right be vindicated. So that's really what they're about. It's not personal that I don't like you, or you were mean to me, and I hope God gets you because you don't like me, it's that the right be vindicated, that justice be done. And another point to make about these scriptures, and not just in the Psalms, you find these curses in other places, is they express the outrage felt by the speaker, but not so much the literal penalties he intends. In other words, they're a powerful rhetorical way of calling for the defeat of evil. Jeremiah, in chapter 20, when he was treated badly by some ungodly men, gives vent to his feelings by crying out, Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father, a son is born to you, making him very glad. Let that man be like the cities which the Lord overthrew without pity. Why did I come forth from the womb to see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? Well, I don't think Jeremiah was saying there that he really wanted the man who brought the news of his birth to be slaughtered or something like that. It's, it's just a very 
powerful way of saying, I wish I'd never been born. Which really is another way of saying, my life is really hard right now. And I'm calling out to God for help. It wasn't that he literally wanted those things to happen. Then the most important thing to say about these psalms that contain these cries for justice is they express zeal and honor, uh, zeal for the honor and the glory of God. And again, look at Psalm 139. The first part is extremely beautiful. That's the part we love to read and we love to quote. And, but if somebody is in rebellion against God, then the thought that God knows everything and is everywhere and is watching them and knows the words they're going to speak, that would be a very uncomfortable thought. That would be something to make you very uneasy. Whereas for a believer, it's very comforting to know the Lord is with me wherever I go. He is watching over me. The point is the greatness and the wonder of the living God. David is so full of that amazing thought, and he praises God for his glory. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. And then as he thinks of his enemies, the main thing that comes into his mind is not that they're his enemies so much as they are God's enemies. They have made themselves enemies of God. They hate him. They resist his will. They flout his commands. Those who reject the holy love of God bring condemnation upon themselves. The God who's revealed in the Bible is not a sentimental being. He's not sort of an indulgent, grandfatherly kind of person who doesn't care about evil, who's just going to brush the sin under the carpet and say it doesn't matter. No, that's why the cross is so important, because God is a holy God, a just God, and sin must be dealt with. David is simply echoing the attitude of God then when he prays that the unrepentant sinner, the wicked and bloodthirsty, will get their just deserts, what they deserve. They speak of God with evil intent. They take his name in vain. They blaspheme him against him. See, David doesn't just have some kind of a cold, philosophical, theoretical belief that there is a God, that there's a creator, which a lot of people in our time, seem to have. Not much more. David has a warm, personal relationship with the living God. He loves God so much that he desires God to be glorified more than anything. An old Baptist preacher who was um, a tremendous expositor of scripture, Alexander McLaren, once wrote, the measure of our cleaving to that which is good, and to him who is good, settles the measure of our abhorrence of that which is evil. When we truly identify with God, when we love God and love his cause, then attacks on him will be felt as attacks on us. It was said of a pioneer missionary named Henry Martin, an Anglican, who went out to the Middle East, um, long time ago, and learned the languages of the people and labored among them. Henry Martin once heard a Muslim prince named Mirza Seed Ali describing the slaughter of Christians and as being so bad that Jesus, from a lower level of heaven, reached up and tugged on the robe of Muhammad and pleaded for mercy. And Martin was cut to the heart by this blasphemy. He said, I could not endure existence if Jesus was not glorified. It would be hell to me if he were to be always thus dishonored. When he was questioned, he said, if anyone pluck out your eyes, there's no saying why you feel pain, it is feeling. It is because I am one with Christ that I am thus dreadfully wounded. Can you relate to that at all? Do you love God? Do you care about his honor? So that if he is being dishonored in the world, 
you, you take it personally. It, it bothers you, troubles you. So it's concern and desire for the glory of God and righteous indignation against those who oppose the Lord that is behind verses like, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Now notice the Psalms call on God to judge and overthrow his enemies and the enemies of his people. As somebody said, these prayers place retribution squarely in the hands of Yahweh, of Jehovah, in acknowledgement that it is only he who can and should carry out the judgment and so receive the glory. If we're offended by these psalms, it may be because we don't care enough about right and wrong and about God's honor. We don't take them as seriously as we should. These passages remind us to be God-centered in our thinking and our praying and living. They teach us about God's hatred of sin and just judgment. They tell us to trust in God rather than take matters into our own hands. They reveal God's concern for persecuted believers. We live in a moral universe where God governs and he will accomplish his purpose. And as somebody has said, they remind us that Christians should not be complacent about sin or passive regarding evil, but should have a righteous indignation against that which opposes God and his purposes. Probably many Christians wonder how we can read these verses and square them with the teaching of Jesus and his apostles. Jesus teaching about loving our enemies Paul saying, for example, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Romans 12, 14. And are we not to love the sinner and hate the sin? As the saying goes. Well, there's a real element of truth in that. I can hate the lies that my neighbor tells, and yet at the same time, pray for my neighbor and want him to repent of those lies and come to know the Lord. Yet at the same time, as John Stott commented helpfully, the expression can be overpressed, loving the sinner and hating the sin. For evil is not something abstract. There isn't something out here called evil. Evil is in the hearts and the ways of evildoers. Judgment will fall on evildoers, not on evil in the abstract. So it's kind of complicated. Sinners are both under the wrath and the love of God. As long as life remains, we will seek their salvation. Our attitude is to be like that of the Lord. We're to oppose every evil. We need to stand against every cruelty and dishonesty and lust and pride. In short, we're to declare war on everything that is sin. Of course, it's difficult, if not impossible, as been said, to feel such sentiments with purity without any admixture of personal venom. If you know your own heart, you know that we are not perfectly pure, and sometimes we may think it's righteous indignation against what is wrong, but there may be some of our own personal selfish feelings in there too. So we have to be on guard about that. We need to be cautious about using words like we find in these Psalms. We, we're, we can't sort of easily and glibly use these words of the psalmist. Now you know that some Christians uh, don't like to use any sort of military language. They don't want to say, put on the whole armor of God and take the sword of the spirit. Uh, they don't like the hymns that say, you know, soldiers of Christ arise, or onward Christian soldiers. And I think I get that. Uh, that imagery can be abused. We have to be careful about it. But at the same time, um, there have been times uh, when some people have read imprecatory psalms, or maybe it's accounts of the Israelites attacking their enemies, and they've said, or maybe it's even just 
being a Christian soldier. And so they say, um, well, therefore, I can go and literally fight against people physically. Um, that, that, that we can use violent methods to promote the kingdom of God. And we've all heard of things like this. You know, there were, uh, haven't heard of it lately, fortunately, but a number of years back there were uh, fanatics in the pro-life movement who were shooting doctors who performed abortions. They were shooting and killing abortionists. Um, I have no idea what was in the mind of that young man in London, Ontario, who plowed into the Muslim family out for a walk and killed them. He had a church background. Maybe he'd heard something and it got garbled somehow in his mind. I think his mind was very confused and deranged. But killing people is not in accord with Christ's teaching. It's not going to advance his kingdom. We shouldn't think we're on a holy war the way Israel was against the um, Canaanites. We're not ancient Israel. Yes, we're in a spiritual battle. We're against Satan and the demons and all those who are blinded by Satan and follow him. But never forget what Paul says in, 1 in 2 Corinthians 10.4, the weapons of our warfare are not worldly. Or if you like the King James, carnal. The weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Our weapons are faith and prayer, and the word of God, and the love of God. So we hate the enemies of God by loving them. If they're persecutors or atheists or pornographers or whoever they are, they may be ranged against Christ and his church, and we're against them, but our weapons are not carnal. We're to love them, to try to, we're to pray for them, to try to witness to them, to seek to win them to our Lord. Are you engaged in the battle? Are you engaged then in prayer? Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. Are we praying? Are we soaking our mind and heart daily in scripture? Are we doing all we can to evangelize, to take the good news to other people? Are we supporting world missions? Psalm 139 closes as it began with talking about God's searching the hearts and the feelings, the thoughts of the believer. It's a, a beautiful close. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. It's as if David is saying, I don't want to give free reign to unrighteous anger. I don't want to just lose personal vindictiveness. I think that what I'm saying is God-honoring. I think it's for your glory, Lord. But if there's sinful self in this to any extent, then show that to me and correct me. Search me. Try my ways. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David doesn't confine his attack to the evil around him. He faces what may be within him. So after talking about these bloodthirsty evildoers, he then looks at his own life and says, Lord, search me and help me to deal with my own life. The New Testament wants us to be just as single-minded as David was in this psalm, but it redirects the fighting spirit we're to fight against evil in our lives as we pray to become more like Jesus Christ. I like old hymns. I know you do too, and you had, I was amazed you would memorize that uh, hymn, When I Surveyed the Wondrous Cross. Came in handy to have it memorized today. <laughs> and I'm not knocking Chris and Andrew and David and... Um, it happened. 
But one children's hymn I've always liked says, Oh, day by day, each Christian child has much to do without, within. A death to die for Jesus' sake, a constant war to wage with sin. When deep within our swelling hearts, the thoughts of pride and anger rise, when bitter words are on our tongues and tears of passion in our eyes, then we may stay the angry blow. Then we may check the hasty word, give gentle answers back again, and fight a battle for our Lord. And let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful psalm and for your entire word. We know that every part is there for some reason and has something to teach us. Lord, may we learn the lessons of how you hate sin, of how you want your people to be centered on you and seek your glory. And Lord, may we always be thinking more of the evil in our own lives and may we continue in the unrelenting war against our pride and our selfishness, all our many sins. And may we, by the Holy Spirit's power, be changed over time until that day when we are perfectly conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. All these things we pray in his name. Amen.